Throughout the pandemic, it's been mainly questions for ministers and scientists, their strategy, their thinking, death rates, testing kit, infection levels. Now, those questions have not gone away. But in the next phase of this, as we start to unlock, there's also dilemmas for the rest of us. How much risk are we prepared to put up with? Are you willing to clamber into a crowded bus or commuter train to get to work? Will you stay on furlough at home for as long as possible to protect your loved ones? Will you enter crowded shops, walk along crowded pavements? What about masks? When the great unlocking begins, each one of us is going to have to take difficult personal decisions in an unfamiliar world. Questions this morning for all of us. And a lot of those questions are about transport, family holidays, social distancing while travelling to work. To answer them, I'm joined by Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, and talking of holidays and travel by that great television adventurer, Sir Michael Palin. All of this, however, is in the context of continued huge death rates. I'm joined by Sir Ian Diamond, the government's chief statistician, and by Maria van Kerkhove, the World Health Organization's technical lead on COVID-19. In Wales, they're looking at a subtly different route out of the lockdown. I'll be talking to the First Minister there, Labour's Mark Drakeford. And finally, the future of telly in this perplexing year. The actor Eddie Marson's been starring in one of ITV's new lockdown dramas. It was filmed at home. His children were roped in and the director was his long-suffering wife. Before that, we'll be looking at the news through the eyes of The Guardian's editor, Kath Viner, and backed by popular demand, the BBC's health editor, Hugh Pym. A very busy show that begins with the news from Sally Nugent. Good morning. As the number of people in the UK who have died from coronavirus rises above 28,000, the Prime Minister has spoken for the first time about his experience of being in intensive care. He told The Sun on Sunday contingency plans were made in case he died. John McManus reports. Coronavirus continues to take its toll on families across the UK. The country now has the second highest death toll in Europe behind Italy. 28,131 people have now succumbed to the virus and thousands more were left severely ill, including the Prime Minister. In an interview with The Sun on Sunday, Boris Johnson said doctors had to administer litres and litres of oxygen and at one point he wondered, how am I going to get out of this? In the end, Mr Johnson didn't reach the stage where he needed to use a ventilator. Good morning. Now back at work, one of the biggest issues he faces is how to leave the lockdown. A review is due on Thursday. At the start of the restrictions, 1.8 million people in England were told to shield themselves as they were considered most at risk. At Saturday's Downing Street briefing, the government indicated that those restrictions could be reviewed as more evidence emerged. We do recognise that asking somebody to stay shielded for their own uh, health protection for a very long period of time, and it may be several months, uh, is, is a quite a difficult thing for them to do. Many European countries are now coming out of their lockdowns. The challenge for the government is to formulate a successful road plan for Britain. John McManus, BBC News. More than 2,000 coronavirus patients in England, Wales and Northern Ireland had to be treated for kidney failure as well as respiratory problems. Those affected required specialist renal support treatment, according to an intensive care research charity. It has led to a shortage in essential equipment. A business group has called on the government to keep levels of public spending high to help boost the economy after the lockdown is lifted. The British Chambers of Commerce says a carefully phased reopening of business is needed as soon as possible to prevent businesses from failing. North and South Korean troops have exchanged gunfire along the demilitarized zone which separates the two countries. The South Korean military said bullets were fired from the north, prompting troops to broadcast a warning and fire back. No casualties or damage were reported. It is the first such incident in five years. 
and a six-week-long national state of emergency will come to an end in Portugal tomorrow. Small shops and businesses will reopen with restaurants and cafes following two weeks later. Face masks are now compulsory on all public transport. That is all from me. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Andrew. Many thanks for that, Sally. And now, as ever, to the front pages of the newspapers. There's the Sunday Times. Set free healthy over 70s, say doctors. There's a lot of controversy about that story. We'll talk about it later on. Um, the Sun on Sunday. David Wooding, their political editor, has the scoop interview with Boris Johnson. And I have to say it's a big scoop. It's a really good read. Very, very interesting. That We'll talk about that as well later on. The Observer has picked an interesting story as well. They've been looking at polling, showing that we are quite fearful. We don't actually want to leave the lockdown too quickly as a country. Fearful Britons insist don't open restaurants, schools or stadiums. That's something that ministers will obviously be thinking about. Uh, the Mail on Sunday has looked at the, the pictures of uh, Boris's baby and uh, they say he's got daddy's hair. Well, I wish I had daddy's hair. No, I don't. I just wish I had a little bit more of my own hair. Um, Sunday Mirror, reward our brave frontline heroes. That's their Corona Caris campaign. Um, there's sacrifice to Sunday people. And the Sunday Telegraph is a very interesting story here. It says that primary schools are going to go back at the beginning of June. And again, they've got the picture of Carrie and the baby. Well, the Sunday Telegraph story, Andrew, uh, refers to June the 1st as a possible date for primaries to go back to work uh, more easily. And the story also refers to employers doing an ongoing role in virus testing of their staff just as part of the national effort to work out how quickly the virus is actually spreading. Very interesting. Um, Catherine, um, you've picked the Observer's front page story, which is an interesting one because obviously we kind of assume, listening to people in the economy, that everyone wants to get back to work as quickly as possible. But that is not the national mood. That's right. According to this uh, poll for the Observer, fewer, fewer than one in five of the public believe the time is right to consider reopening schools, restaurants, pubs and stadiums. So it rather puts the other story into context. And I think it's interesting about we're so fear why we're so fearful. Other um, uh, polls have, have said that we're more fearful than other countries. And I think it's, it's really worth thinking about whether public messaging needs to be more nuanced now. I mean, lockdown itself is quite dangerous, isn't it? There's another report in The Observer that says that the number of households uh, with children going hungry has doubled since lockdown began. We've obviously seen these terrible figures on domestic violence and child abuse and mental health problems. And so I think we're we'd desperately in need of a more nuanced message right now. The other thing that I was mentioning right at the beginning of the show, Catherine, was people beginning to think about going back to work, commuting, getting onto those trains. A really, really complicated job for the government to ensure <laughs> some kind of social distancing. I don't know how you do it on buses and trains and you think of the queues outside bus stops and so forth. And the Sunday Times has done a big number on that on page seven, I think. Yeah, it's incredibly interesting. It says that the only way you can have social distancing on public transport is to cut the number of passengers down to 15% of what we had before. So they say, sort of say that a train that typically had 1,200 passengers on it now only has room for 200. And they sort of would say that you'd sort of tape off every other seat, like as a sort of checkerboard, uh, sort of chessboard so how effect. Do you, how do you possibly restart the economy <laughs> properly with 15% of the workforce? It's incredibly difficult. I mean, I think when you read stories like that, you realise that sort of all white collar workers, or in fact, anybody who's been able to work from home, you think is probably going to have to end up working from home for quite some time. Really, really interesting. Hugh, let me turn to um, the, the Sunday Times story I was talking about, because there's a bit of an arm wrestle going on between Number 10 and the Sunday Times at the moment. They hated that big, long, right-through piece about the failures they've made in the past. And again this morning, in response to that story, uh, Matt Hancock, the health secretary, has tweeted this, and we can see it now. There is the tweet. Um, and he's really clearly quite cross about that. He's saying it's an, uh, an untrue story, exaggerated and so forth. What do you think is the, is the... He says there is no truth in the suggestion that all over 70s are going to be asked to stay at home for 12 weeks. Well, the current gu guidance that was set out when these restrictions began was that the over 70s, whatever their condition, if they were basically healthy, should just be a little more vigilant. It was perfectly OK to go out for a bit of exercise, but just be particularly careful. The group that were told for 12 weeks they had to stay indoors were the 1.8 million with 
really quite serious underlying conditions, including the over 70s. So there may be a bit of confusion over that. And I suspect that the message that over 70s after restrictions are eased will still have to stay at home is not something that the government wants to put out there. Whereas if you're over 70 with a health condition in one of these categories, I think probably you will be told it's better to stay at home. And of course, the Sunday Times knows that a lot of its readers over 70s are getting really quite hacked off by the idea they're going to have to stay in while everybody else gets out. Yes, I think there are, there are many over 70 who are perfectly healthy, want to get out for their exercise like everybody else and go to the shops and yeah. they're feeling they don't want to be told to, to, to stay at home if they're basically fit and well. Uh, Catherine, can I turn to the Sun's front page? I said at the beginning it was quite a scoop for David Wooding. I won't, he won't mind me saying so, their veteran political uh, editor and correspondent. And it's an, an interesting read, not just in terms of the details of how close to death Boris Johnson actually got, but also his own mood, because he at one point becomes quite emotional in the middle of the interview. Yes, it is some, some very strong quotes. It's sort of, it's, he says that the doctors were preparing to announce his death um, he said he, he didn't take it seriously at the beginning that he was in denial, which um, certainly seems to be true. Um, but he, he, so he also said that he never actually thought he was going to um, die because of his own sense of his own terrible buoyancy, which is an interesting phrase. But I have to say the line that stood out best for me was that he said they, they had a strategy to deal with a death of Stalin type scenario, um, which, you know, and considering that movie is about yeah. uh, covering up... <laughs> the death of a leader and sort of terrible infighting about who should follow him. I mean, perhaps it says something about the government's attitudes to, to news management. I don't know. <laughs> very good. Catherine, thanks very much indeed. Uh, finally, Hugh, there's another story on the front page of The Telegraph. The Nightingale Hospital. We were also pleased to see it open, but it's more or less empty. Yes, the big Nightingale Hospital in London's Docklands, we're told, uh, only has ever had about 20 or 30 patients. That's never been formally confirmed. They had room for up to 500 to start with in intensive care. Of course, there are Nightingales in other parts of the UK, around England and in Belfast, the Louisa Jordan in Glasgow, the Dragon's Heart in Cardiff. But it could be one of these stories after the event mm. was too much capacity created. And this story refers to the modelling, which suggested a large number of over 80s would need intensive care beds, which is now proving not to have been the case. And we can't complain about things going right, can we? Because after all, it might have gone, it might have been needed very, very severely indeed. And so the fact that there aren't people there is in, in a sense a piece of good news. It is. And we had all these reports from Italy about how hospitals were being overrun. So the view was, let's take every precaution, create all this intensive care capacity. Yeah. I suspect the Nightingales will be kept on for COVID patients in the so? future, mm. freeing up other uh, hospital beds for other, other conditions. Because of course, there's a lot of work that was put off, that was postponed, which is now coming back on stream. It's very important for hospitals to get back to doing that uh, for the sort of overall health of the nation. Uh, meanwhile, Catherine, across Europe, some people are staggering, blinking out into the daylight. Um, the Observer's been covering the opening up in Spain, where people have been under lockdown for six weeks, some of them. Yes, I love this picture of people being allowed out to exercise, but it's, it's very limited. I mean, the, 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 um, the lockdown in Spain has been pretty um, draconian. Uh, but, you know, it, it, they've released it and adults are now allowed to exercise between 6 and 10 and 8 and 11 only. Children in the afternoon and older people, the odd hour in between. Uh, and the pictures are sort of very exuberant, people running around the streets. And there were some great videos last night of people cycling uh, around the ring, ring roads of, of the cities. But I think it's a reminder that the UK's lockdown has been much more casual than, than many others. I mean, Spain's so-called lifting of their lockdown is still a lot more draconian than ours is now. And there's certainly lots of people out exercising around London yesterday. Catherine Viner, thank you very much indeed thank for you. joining us this morning. Much appreciated. Hugh as well, thanks for joining us as well. And so to the weather, some really cold and very wet days down in the south, though Scotland and the north had it a bit easier. But with the arrival of May, it does seem that summer is perhaps beginning properly. Or is that just me being optimistic again? Not that I'm often optimistic. Over to Susan Powell in the weather. With Susan. A very good morning to you, Andrew. Well, you know, whether we love a map and we love a statistic, here are both together. This is April 2020 across the UK. The browner the map, the drier it was. We didn't see many April showers to the north, that's for sure. Some parts of northern England got less than 20% of their average rainfall. And therefore, it goes uh, pretty much hand in hand that for some of us, it was exceptionally sunny. For the UK as a whole, the sunniest April on record. In some areas, we saw over 50% more 
sunshine than we may have expected typically. Today, a little bit short on the sunshine to the south. We've got this weather front feeding cloud into England and Wales, but actually this isn't where the bulk of our rainfall for today is going to come from. There's quite a lot of dry weather, I think, for the south through the remainder of the day, albeit misty and murky with a little spot of drizzle here or there. It's further north where we have the best of the sunshine to start the day that we're going to spark off some heavy thundery showers come the afternoon across Scotland, northern England, getting down into the Midlands and parts of East Anglia. And they will linger on into the early part of Monday. But come Monday afternoon, I think we're going to see things becoming much drier to the northeast. There'll be a lot of sunshine across at the board and for the week as a whole aside from some rain for the southwest potentially on Tuesday there's a lot of dry weather to come and we're more in the way of dry weather and more in the way of sunshine temperatures look like they will be on the up there you go summer arrives on Monday Sir Ian Diamond is the UK's national statistician and the head of the Office of National Statistics. The government are waiting for his latest figures before they finalise details of the first phase of the unlocking to be announced next week. He's running a massive study with up to 300,000 people to see just how far the virus has really spread in the UK. And I spoke to him just before we came on air. I asked him to begin with what he thinks the true number of people who have died because of COVID-19 in the UK is right now. Well, I think uh, the numbers uh, on the podium yesterday were 28,131. And I think that's a good starting point because I think the Public Health England has done a very good job recently to bring in care home deaths. But let's remember, those are only uh, the deaths where there's been a positive um, test uh, that has shown COVID-19. I think we need to add to that um, a number that we will find as we get death registrations where the medical practitioner without a test uh, has placed COVID-19 uh, on the death certificate. And I suggest that that will push us towards uh, 30,000. But I think we also need to remember uh, that at the moment we are seeing the highest number of deaths each week that we at the Office of National Statistics have recorded um, since uh, weekly records started in 1993. And I think just, just, just before I comment, I think it's worth saying that each one of these deaths represents a, a family grief, a, a friends being really upset. And we always remember that at the Office of National Statistics. But when we see these very, very high levels of deaths, not all of them, not all of them are, are the result uh, of COVID-19. The last week we had uh, records for uh, the excess was approaching uh, 12,000 deaths of which uh, I would suggest between eight and 9,000 uh, were, were, were COVID, uh, and then the rest were what we call indirect deaths. Those could be, you know, for example, uh, people who would normally have gone into hospital uh, for, for, for some reason, um, but, the death, but the beds were not available. Just to give you an example, in my late mother's uh, last couple of years uh, of her life, she went into hospital and back out again a few times. Had she not been able to go in uh, one of those times, she may well have died a little earlier than she did. And, and so I think it's important to recognise um, that there are indirect deaths as well as the COVID-related deaths. We have a piece uh, from the Office of National Statistics that we've done jointly with the Government Actuaries Department, the Home Office and Department of Health coming out uh, in, in the next few days, which will show also a third group which will come out over the next few years. Uh, where changes in the prioritisation of the health service, for example, reductions in cancer screening, will lead to, 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 to deaths over the next few years. And the final thing I would just like to say, Andrew, is that if we have a lengthy and deep recession, uh, then we know that that can lead to increased uh, deaths as people are pushed um, by in, into lengthy periods of unemployment. Uh, so, uh, the, the actually, if you like, the, the headline numbers, um, uh, of where that I started with needs to be um, adjusted and, and added to by those indirect deaths. And so looking again for a total, perhaps something like north of 30,000 is what is what you seem to be implying. And can I add to that this excess deaths measurement? The Financial Times' Chris Giles has done an assessment and he says he thinks about 60 percent more than the hospital deaths that are being announced is the kind of figure we should be looking at. Well, Chris Giles is a very um, good uh, statistical journalist. Um, I'm not going to go to 60 percent, but because I think it, you know, one is, one is uh, projecting there and it's very, very difficult um, to, to do that. 
but absolutely certainly uh, the indirect deaths that come on top of the actual COVID-19 deaths are not insignificant. It sounds to me as if, for what you're saying, that we may be heading indeed for the worst death toll in Europe at the moment. I wouldn't say that at all. Um, and um, I would say uh, that making international comparisons, Andrew, is an unbelievably difficult thing to do. Uh, we, uh, in, in this country, have, in my opinion, and let me be clear, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think we have the best reporting, the most transparent reporting, uh, and the most timely reporting, because we include death registrations, and we've been pushing our death registration um, reporting as fast as we possibly can. Um, and, and then even after you look at the actual deaths, it's incredibly important to recognize that the context. So um, deaths are going to be more concentrated, as I've already indicated, in inner cities. If you have a rural country, um, then it's likely that your death rates uh, will be lower. I'm not saying um, that um, we're, we're at the bottom of any potential league table. It's almost impossible to calculate a league table, uh, but uh, I'm not prepared to say that we're heading to the top. Um, and can I be clear, does this mean that we will never, ever know? Uh, well, we'll certainly be able to give you some very, very accurate data um, around, uh, obviously, COVID-19. We will be able to make some pretty accurate uh, estimates uh, in uh, the, the, the short to medium term around many uh, of those excess deaths. Uh, but as I said, the, the estimation of the deaths that uh, might come if there were, if there were, and let me be clear, so much is being done to avoid uh, a lengthy recession. But if there were to be a lengthy recession, it'd be very, very difficult to get an absolutely accurate count there. Can I ask you about this very important R number, which is the rate of reproduction of the disease, the rate of spreading of the disease? And if it's under one, that's a good thing. And if it's above one, that's a very bad thing. What is your current estimate of the R number? Well, I think it, my, I'm very clear that it's under one um, from the estimates uh, that one can make. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to support the really excellent um, and high level modelling that is being done uh, by colleagues right across uh, the country uh, who are, are making some of those estimates. Now, the ONS is carrying out this big national survey. What do you think it's going to tell us? Well, we, we are through the initial peak. I'm really clear in my mind about that. What we now need to do over the next uh, year or so, or, or uh, until we have a vaccine uh, or, or a really good treatment, what we now need to do is we need to monitor the course uh, of the epidemic to understand uh, the, the, the proportion of people at any time who are carrying the virus and also the proportion uh, of people who, who have antibodies against the virus. And that's why we have uh, worked with colleagues uh, at um, the University of Oxford Wellcome Trust to be able to, to design a, a really good national survey which will enable us to understand uh, both those things. Does it give you any indication yet at all of how many people have had COVID-19 in Britain? It, it's too early, Andrew. I mean, I'd be delighted to come back in a few weeks' time and give you an authoritative answer to that. Yeah. Um, you know, these surveys like this typically take uh, months to put into place. We've managed to put this in the field in 10 days. Uh, and we are just starting uh, to get uh, some initial uh, results, um, um, but it's too early to be able to give you an estimate of R or indeed an estimate of prevalence. Now, you said the peak we've passed in the country. I, I don't know whether you've got any indication of when we passed the peak, but I wonder what, why you think care homes are still such a problem. Well, I think care homes you know, represent a, a real challenge. Uh, and of course, some of the reasons for that is we know um, that here are a group of people, often with comorbidities, often very old. And so we have been working hard uh, with our colleagues uh, in Public Health England to, to design um, some studies properly to look at that. And I'm hoping that we'll be going into the field uh, in the next very short while with that. This week, the ONS um, published data on the larger proportion of poorer people who are have, have, uh, dying of COVID-19. And I wonder what your thoughts are. There are lots and lots of reasons why this might be happening. But what are your indications as to why? Is, is it to do with kind of density of population or obesity or comorbidities or what? 
Well, I'd certainly say it's likely to be with to do with uh, density of population. It is likely also to be with, with comorbidities. Also, people uh, in, in poorer areas are, are probably going to be in jobs which make them less likely to be able to work from home. So, so they may be uh, more uh, exposed. Um, and, and of course, you, we always know that inner cities uh, are, are the most uh, risky places. So, but I have to say, having said that, um, the, the, these numbers are stark. Um, but we have known for a very, very long time um, that ill health uh, and mortality has a gradient towards the poorest and most disadvantaged members of our society. Uh, and it is sad that that is shown uh, clearly also uh, with regard to COVID-19. I suppose there's an allied question about so-called BAME or ethnic minority deaths. Now, I know the ONS doesn't track ethnicity and i wonder whether you're going to do that and what your thoughts are about the higher number of bame people who are dying of this i think it's um you know very clear that the uh, higher number of bame people uh, are uh, dying and we in our next uh, study that will come out uh, i hope later this week uh, are looking uh, at that issue and i think it's important to recognize uh, that we what we try to do is look at it at the same time as occupation so that we are able um, to really understand um, the, the, the link between occupation uh, and COVID and also between BAME uh, and COVID. And we'll, we'll be doing uh, that uh, this week. Uh, I think it's something that we need to look at, or we are looking at incredibly carefully. Um, finally, if I may, um, everybody is now starting to think about the timing and the how of the ending of the lockdown. And I wonder whether um, you've picked up anything about people's anxieties about going back to work, anxieties about the end of the lockdown that might have some influence on how ministers will eventually decide to do this. Well, our job is to inform uh, government with, with data. And one of the things we have done is that we have been doing a weekly survey uh, of people's attitudes to and indeed adherence uh, to the lockdown. Uh, and, and the results uh, show, yes, people, very large numbers of people, uh, over 80 percent, uh, are reporting that they are concerned still, that they um, are, are worried about not being able to make plans uh, and, and, and that they are worried um, about the future. On the other hand, um, we're seeing uh, a, a reduction in them being concerned about things like being able to get um, staples and, and being able to get food uh, and other uh, goods. Um, and we are finding those people who uh, are homeschooling are feeling able to do that. So we are informing uh, government both that the adherence to the lockdown, I think it has been very successful, has been very, very uh, good. Uh, and we're giving all the information we can about what uh, people uh, are feeling uh, about that lockdown. At the end of the day, ministers have a very difficult decision to make. They do. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us, Sir Ian. Much appreciated and absolutely fascinating. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Sir Michael Palin, one of the immortal pythons, is perhaps better known these days for his travel documentaries. He's been doing these for 40 years and he's also a contributor to a book, Dear NHS, Raising Money for Health Charities. When I spoke to him this morning, I asked him, as one of life's great optimists, how he was coping with the lockdown. Well, I'm actually quite enjoying it um, in a rather guilty way. It's rather like sort of enforced retirement. Um, Many of the day I've woken up thinking, oh, gosh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do the other, and suddenly finding a day when you, you know, your diary is completely empty. In fact, um, the next month is completely empty. Mm. As Barry Cryer once said, you know, oh, I get snow blindness from looking at my diary. But it, it is so white and empty at the moment. But it means you can do other things at a slightly different pace, which I'm rather enjoying. What, one of the things you've been doing is you've contributed to this book to raise funds for health uh, charities the, on the NHS, about your NHS experiences. Just give us a little glimpse of what you've been saying. Well, I think all the contributors were asked to give their experiences the NHS. Um, I'm fortunate because I haven't had to go to hospital very much during my life, but my piece is really about the, the humanity and the humour of my experiences uh, when in the NHS. I think there's a most extraordinary relationship happens between the people who deal with you on the wards and the doctors and yourself. 
um, they get to know you at the moment of crisis. There's no sort of gentle build up, or we'll call each other the next day. Straight away, you're into um, a psychological and emotional relationship with them, just as strong as the medical relationship. So I'm just sort of uh, reminiscing on how humor had helped me when I'd been in hospital. And I remember a wonderful time when I had my appendix out at uh, University College Hospital. And the ward was just a wonderful place to be. It was so friendly. And there was an unfortunate man who'd had an operation for piles, and it was quite painful. And he also had a tremendous sense of humor. And he couldn't resist either telling jokes or asking other people to tell him jokes. And they would cause absolute agony. So he would sort of, ha, 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 ha. And it was just the general feeling in the ward. Those two mm. or three crisis days I was there. The, the people who cared for us made us feel as though they were our friends for that brief time. And I think that's a terrific thing that people do in the NHS. Well, of course, medical humour, the humour of doctors is notorious. But you are known to an awful lot of people these days primarily as one of our great travellers. And I'd just be very interested on your reflections. As people look ahead and realise they're not going to get that summer holiday, they're not going to be able to jump on a plane, and we're going to probably travel less in the future, how should we cope with that? I think you can travel less and travel better, if you know what I mean. I mean, if we have to be confined to traveling um, in the UK, I mean, it's not a bad place to travel. There are all sorts of wonderful places and different landscapes and different sort of atmospheres, northern Scotland, Cornwall. Mm. Go to places and um, learn more about them, enjoy them more, find out more about your own country. Because I think it's going to be very difficult for, uh, and, uh, for people right across the world to actually... Um, travel again as they did before until we find a vaccine. Nobody is going to pack people in airplanes. There's no, there's going to be no cheap and cheerful flights around the world. It's going to be very, very difficult um, to uh, to see mm. the rest of the rest of the world. So I think narrow your horizons is not necessarily a bad thing. Look more carefully. Look more thoroughly. Um, learn to enjoy your own country. I would say that's it. Travelling is not necessarily exotic. It can be local, but it can still be as as interesting and inspirational, I think. Michael, um, you're in your 70s. If the government decided to ask all over 70s, all over 70s, to stay in for another 12 weeks, would you regard that as a bit unfair? I would, yes. I think it's uh, it's difficult call every time, but you've got to be more selective here because there are a great deal, a uh, great number of people in, the, in their 70s who are very active, very thoughtful, have got lots of ideas, can contribute um, to um, recovery. And I think that to treat them all as people who, who have to be sort of um, kept out of sight is, is going to be very difficult and very wrong and very unfair on mm. a lot of people who want to help and are active and can contribute an awful lot to the growing economy. So, and you know, I, I, I think you've got to be careful. And of course, there are people even in their 80s who remain very active, which is lucky for you, because I gather you had a bad fire in your kitchen. You were rescued by your 80-something-year-old neighbour. Well, <laughs> well, I have to tell you, actually, this was all a complete uh, piece of fake news. I wrote a comic <laughs> article in a magazine called The Idler about taking it easy after a heart operation. And everything was fabricated apart from the heart operation. Um, but someone picked up the story, and, and at one point I was just, it was a chapter accident, rather in the three men in a boat style, and one of which was, I, you know, I was um, doing deep breathing exercises to calm down, blew a piece of paper onto the gas ring, it ignited a Sainsbury's bill, I tried to put it out with a, with a towel, the towel caught fire, um, and I was rescued by um, an 86-year-old neighbour who just had a, a sextuple heart bypass a week before and I was dragged to safety and someone took this seriously. Oh, <laughs> so you, Michael Palin, I, like, hmm? Michael Sorry. Palin, I'm horrified uh, and chagrined to realise that Michael Palin is the source of fake news circulating oh, yeah. around the internet. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us nonetheless. The inimitable Michael Palin. Now, last week we heard from the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, about her strategy to exit the lockdown. The Welsh government says it would like to leave lockdown at the same time as England, but it's been, quote, a bit of a struggle to get agreement and it's now preparing its own possible measures. Labour's Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales, joins me now. Mr Drakeford, welcome. Um, can I ask you about those separate Welsh measures? What is Wales going to do potentially that England won't? Well, let me begin by just repeating what you said. 
and my strong preference is that we agree a common set of measures right across the United Kingdom and we adopt a common timetable. So just as we went into lockdown on the same day and on the same terms, we'll come out of it in the same way. But we are preparing, of course, in Wales to make sure that when the time comes that it's right to reopen our schools, we have a way of doing it as we begin to increase the routine activity that the health service can carry out. We've got a plan for that. We reopen workplaces carefully with the cooperation of our trade union colleagues. I want to do it on a UK basis, and I still think that that's what we can achieve. You mentioned schools there as something that the Welsh Government will announce itself. Uh, can you give us any indication, therefore, as to your thinking about when schools in Wales can start to reopen? Well, our advice from the trades unions and from the local education authorities is that it will need three weeks as a minimum from the point that we decide to do that to when schools can reopen. So we are talking about the beginning of June uh, there. And we are thinking about ways in which we can bring young people with special educational needs back into education. We're thinking about particular year groups, year six children in primary schools, children going up to secondary school this September. We know that that's a rite of passage. You do it with your classmates and yet you won't have seen those uh, friends for some weeks now. So could we bring those children back to school earlier than others? We have a bilingual education system here in Wales. Children who are learning through the medium of Welsh and who may not have Welsh spoken at home. Do we need to get those children back into education sooner? Those are the sort of things that we are working on at the moment. And what, what is your thinking about social distancing? Because talking to people who are working in schools right now is going to be verging on the impossible to persuade, you know, ebullient children to socially distance in a classroom. Are you going to limit the number of kids coming into schools at different times or different days or ration schooling in some other way? Well, you certainly can't have schools reopen as they did before and sustain social distancing. And you need social distancing for public health reasons, but you also need it in order to persuade parents and teachers that you are asking young people to come back into an environment that is safe for them. And that's the other big piece of work we are doing at the moment. You can open anything you like, but if people don't think it's safe to go there, then they'll vote with their feet. Mm. And there's a huge amount of work for us to do to make sure that as we begin to open up parts of the economy and society again, we have a new set of rules in place that demonstrates to the population that we've thought carefully about it, that we're doing these things in a way that meets the circumstances we are now in, and that it is safe for them to go back to school, to go back to work, to go back to the library, whatever it may be, if we can't demonstrate to people we put that thinking in, in advance, can organise those things mm, in yeah. a way that gives you confidence but about them, we won't succeed in what we're trying to achieve. Ultimately, these kids need to go back to school. The schools are of a certain size. Are we not going to have to simply expand the number of classrooms, expand the size of schools in a hurry in order to get British children, Welsh children, English children, Scottish children educated? Well, I think of this in a phased way. We're not going to have all the children back in all the schools on the first day. We get those children in for whom we have the greatest priority to begin with. We monitor that carefully. We add more children in as we are confident that we can do that safely. And over time, we will get back to something like the normal we were used to. There's a real problem about care homes in Wales. When are you going to announce the testing of all staff and residents in all care homes in Wales? Because that is surely now essential. Well, we are testing all care home staff and all care home residents where there is any coronavirus in that home. I'm sorry, I'm asking about all care homes. Yes, well, the advice we have from our chief medical officer is that if there is no coronavirus at all in a care home, then testing all residents and all staff would not be the best use of the tests that we have available. So any care home where there is a case of coronavirus, mm. everybody is being tested. Where there is no coronavirus in circulation at all, then the clinical case for doing that 
is not one that we have been advised to implement. This is what I find very hard, if you don't mind me saying so, to understand, because what we know is that across the country, uh, non-symptomatic people with COVID-19 were sent without testing from hospitals into care homes when they then passed it around. So we know that in care homes around the place, there are people who have COVID-19 but are not showing symptoms. Surely, therefore, if you're going to stop this huge outbreak, and some of your colleagues have described it as being like wildfire in Welsh care homes, you're going to have to test everybody going into, into care homes. Well, I can give you and people in Wales an assurance that as if we were to receive advice from those people who understand this in that clinical and scientific way, that that is the right thing to do, then that is the policy that we would adopt. But what we do is to follow the advice we have from those best placed to give it to us. We've changed our policy on care testing, in testing in care homes to do more of it. We test everybody who leaves hospital. And if you're tested as positive, you don't go to a care home in Wales. If the advice were to change in future, we would do more of it. But at the moment, we follow the advice that we are given. Well, here's the advice of Mario Kreft, who's chair of Care Forum Wales. She says, admissions from hospitals have been a major factor in spreading the virus like wildfire in care homes. Those patients not displaying symptoms when they were discharged later developed symptoms and infected other residents. The care home sector in the UK and Wales is almost seen as collateral damage, given that 40% of the deaths in Cardiff alone have been in care homes. How do you feel about that? Well, we are very concerned about care homes. I know Mario very well. He's passionate about the work that he and his colleagues do, as are we. It's why we announced on Friday that we are giving £500 to every care home worker that carries out personal care in our care home sector here They might in prefer Wales. tests. And as we get the advice that we get from the people we have to rely on, our chief medical officer, our chief scientific uh, advisors, what they tell us the, is the right thing to do is what we do in Wales. And we've done that right mm. through this and we'll carry on doing that as the, as the whole coronavirus crisis continues to develop. Let me ask you about testing generally. If there's one thing we've learned from Matt Hancock's perhaps rather reckless promise that he was going to get 100,000 tests a day done, is that by setting a big target, you galvanise the whole system. Yet you have abandoned your target of 5,000 tests a day. Wasn't that a mistake? No, it wasn't a mistake. Uh, the, the feeling I had and the feeling I was reported to me from people in the front line is that the number itself was a distraction. We have been focused on the purpose and the point of the test. Carrying out tests without a purpose or a point is not a good use of the limited resources that we have. So we have been concentrating both on the number, and there are more tests in Wales available every week, but on making sure that the tests we have are done in the right place for the right people in the right way, that we learn something from it so that we can act on what we are learning. And that's, I think, how our policy on testing has developed. And I think it's been the right one here in Wales. Another uh, confusing issue for an awful lot of people is whether or not to wear face coverings or masks. What's the Welsh government's view at the moment? Well, people are doing it. Whatever our view is, more and more people, you simply walk around the streets and you see people doing it. Uh, our advice is that it is of marginal utility clinically, but that in confidence terms, people may well feel more willing to go out and to do things if they are wearing a non-medical face covering, not a mask that ends up competing with the NHS for masks, but just simply covering your face. I said to you uh, earlier, Andrew, that we're going to have to do things to persuade people that it is safe for them to resume parts yes. of what was previously normal activity. If wearing a face mask is something that gives people that confidence, we'll certainly be prepared to look at that in Wales. Well, Mark Drayford, thanks very, very much indeed for coming in and talking to us today. Much appreciated. Now then, the World Health Organization is coordinating much of the global response to the pandemic, though it's been attacked by President Trump, who this week called it China's Foreign Relations Agency. Maria van Kerkhove is the technical lead for the WHO on COVID-19, and I asked her about the likelihood of a second wave of infection hitting the countries that are already beginning to release their lockdowns. Um, it's certainly possible. Uh, what we're seeing in a number of countries that have been successful in suppressing transmission is that the virus can, that many more people remain susceptible. 
And what we're seeing in countries like uh, Singapore, where they've seen a sec almost like a second wave, essentially what it is is actually outbreaks that are happening in, in expat dormitories. And so the virus has found a place where it can take hold and it, and it can resurge again. So all countries must remain on alert for the possibility of additional transmission, even if they have been successful in suppressing transmission the first round. Now, one question a lot of people have been asking themselves is to what extent masks are going to be useful in the process of unlocking. So masks are very helpful for in, in a number of situations, first and foremost for our healthcare workers. So that's the priority. And I think everybody agrees with that. We also recommend that people who are in the community um, who are feeling unwell, even if they're feeling a little bit unwell, to wear a mask. And the reason that that's important is because it's for source control. And what that means is from their mouth to someone else. So we do recommend the use of masks um, it, for people who are feeling unwell. But masks alone will not solve the problem. They cannot solve the problem. And especially if you're thinking about lockdowns and you're thinking of lifting lockdowns, there have to be a number of measures that have to be put in place before lockdowns can be released. And it must be done in a slow and a staggered approach. Now, it seems that there's some evidence that the transmission of COVID-19 from children to adults is pretty rare. Does that mean that, for instance, unlocking schools relatively early in the process might be safer? It appears that children seem to be less infected and less developing disease um, from all of the countries where we've seen this virus, um, where we've seen this virus globally, uh, children primarily develop mild disease. And that's really important. We have seen in some very controlled studies where you look at a household, for example, and you follow adults and children over time that adults can infect children. And that's mostly what's happening is adults infecting children. But it can happen the other way around as well. So we can't, children remain susceptible which means they can be infected and it's possible for them to transmit, but it does seem rare. What we really need to understand is people um, was when they heard that people in South Korea had had COVID-19 and recovered and then been reinfected. But it seems that's about false positives. So are you, to be clear, relatively sure that once you've had COVID-19, you can't get it again? And what they're finding in some individuals after they test negative, after a week or two or even longer, they're finding that they're testing positive again. And what is actually happening is as the lungs um, heal, there are parts of the lungs that are um, dead cells that are coming up that are testing. These are there's fragments of those lungs that are actually testing positive for PCR. It's not infectious virus. It's not reinfection. It's not reactivation. It's actually part of the healing process that is being captured again as being positive. So that's that's something that's really interesting. Um, in terms of your question about can people be reinfected, that's a very important question. Uh, what we're learning right now is, is when somebody is infected with COVID-19, they develop antibodies and they develop part of an immune response one to two to three weeks after infection. What we're trying to understand is in that antibody response, does that mean that they have immunity? Um, does it mean they have a, a strong protection against reinfection? And if so, how long that protection lasts? We don't know the answer to that yet. And are we any closer, do you think, in finding a drug that could treat coronavirus patients? Every day we are getting closer and closer to finding therapeutics and a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, the world has come together in solidarity to really look at this. Um, there are hundreds of clinical trials that are currently underway for therapeutics, and we welcome all of these studies. Um, we need to be careful when we look at individual results because we need to make sure that the studies that come out um, have a, a large enough sample size, that they're done in a very robust bust manner um, so that we can see which drugs work and which drugs are safe. And as soon as we have the answers to these, everybody will be aware of this. What's most important is not only having these therapeutics and the vaccines, it's ensuring that we have access, that the world has access to these therapeutics. They can't be developed in some countries and not be accessible to all. A lot of people, of course, have now recovered from COVID-19. Are we learning anything about the longer term health effects of this disease yet? Um, the majority of people who are infected with COVID-19 will make a full recovery. Uh, but there will be some people that may have some longer term effects. Um, it affects the lungs, it affects the body in different ways. And so we may see some damage to the lungs. Again, we need to follow individuals over time. We're in our fourth month of this pandemic. So it's 
very, very early days. Now, earlier this week, I'm sure you noticed that Donald Trump said there was evidence that COVID-19 had escaped from a laboratory in Wuhan in China. Then the intelligence services came out and said, no, no, that's not true. So what can you tell us about what you know about the origins of this disease? Yeah, so coronaviruses normally circulate in animals, uh, and many coronaviruses are circulating in bats. Um, most emerging pathogens, um, viruses, come from an animal reservoir. Everything that we have seen about the, the novel coronavirus is COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Um, of, the, of the tens of thousands of sequences that are available, full genome sequences and partial sequences, compared to other coronavirus sequences that are available, this is of a natural origin. Um, and it originally comes from bats because the coronavirus has come from bats. What we right. need to do is really understand what we call the intermediate host. What is the animal that the that in, was infected from bats that potentially infected humans? It's important what, that we know this because from a public health point of view, it's very important that we find the animal host so that we prevent this, we call spillover from an animal, transmission from an animal to a human. We prevent that spillover from happening again. And so what's your own feeling, your reaction when you hear your president, Donald Trump, saying that the WHO is a public relations organization for China? I can tell you that our teams have been working um, even before this, this virus was even identified on MERS. Um, and, and now when this one came out, knowing that it's a novel coronavirus, to do everything that we can to inform our member states and all people all over the world about what this virus is. Now, I know that you yourself have worked on Ebola and avian flus and other similar viruses. Um, and we read that there are many more such viruses which could jump from animals to humans and infect us in the future. Given, I suppose you could say, that viruses have caught the world's attention at the moment, what more should we be doing as societies to protect ourselves against the next pandemic? In my team and the teams that are working globally on high threat respiratory pathogens, we were preparing for something like this because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And it's very important that we work with populations and people who are working at the what we call the animal-human interface. So these are individuals that are either work with wild animals or work with domesticated animals or who work in forests where they come in close contact. On the longer term, we need to invest in public health. We need to invest in people in our public health systems across all of our countries to ensure that we have the fundamentals in place, people that can test, people that can do contact tracing, people that can care for sick individuals. All of that should be happening now. And making an, an investment in public health measures is good for everyone. If you're not using it for the next disease X, you're using it for influenza. You're using it for other diseases that are circulating in the countries, and it, and it will help save lives. Dr. Van Kerkhove, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. The WHO absolutely clear that COVID-19 did not escape from a laboratory. Now then, lockdown can be challenging on many fronts, whether you're isolating on your own or with family, but it can throw up creative ways of adapting to our new normal as well. The actor Eddie Marston and his wife Janine were coming to terms with the pressure of homeschooling their four children under one roof when Eddie's agent rang to say he'd been offered a job on location. The location, however, would be the Marston family home. Eddie got sent a script by ITV and Janine, who had never directed before, got behind the camera. She filmed Eddie and two of their children as part of a groundbreaking new series of lockdown stories. And I spoke to them a little earlier. I began by asking Eddie, after being directed by Martin Scorsese, Mike Lee, Steven Spielberg and Guy Ritchie, if Janine was the best. Uh, oh, she was fantastic. Uh, she she really um, took it on. She was she was moving the cameras, moving the lights, doing the sounds, cooking the lunch, everything. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, he has to say that, Janine. I'm sure he has to say that. Nonetheless, you hadn't used a camera in in uh, in action before. You had to be taught all of this, I think, uh, online. So, how big was the learning experience for you? It was very big. I was talked through it by um, David Blair, the director, and Len um, con continually, so I was in safe hands. And you looked after him. You, t you told him what to do. Well, we, had, we were also order. directed on Zoom by lots of people that were um, behind us. 
OK, so just give us a little flavour of what this drama, which is called Karen, is actually about, Eddie. It's about a, um, it's about a, a man whose marriage has collapsed. His wife has uh, left him for another man and she's self-isolating with her new partner. And he's left alone with his two teenage boys. And he's full of resentment and bitterness and he's heartbroken. And she wants to see the children and her father, uh, the children's grandfather, played by David Throfnell, comes round to the house to see them and to try to persuade my character to uh, let my ex-wife see the children. So it's basically about, the whole, the whole premise is to, to tell stories about what's happening in every, everyday people's lives, but within the context of isolation and the difficulties that that brings. And while you've been making this film, the two of you have been homeschooling four children, is that right? Two of whom actually appear in the film. Um, they've never acted before, I take it, so it's a surprise for them as well. Yes, um, they've, they've grown up on film sets. They've, they've always come to see me when, wherever I've been in the world. We've always been a family that's kept together. So when they asked to do this, the idea of doing it at home and, and to teach them to collaborate and take on a task like this and get through it with the help of loads of other people, not in the house, but online, on, basically on Zoom calls, was great. Uh, I thought it was a great lesson for the kids. So, David Thelwell, very well known from Shameless, he's not part of your family, clearly. How do you cope with him and social distancing taking part in the film? Well, it, all his scenes were in the garden. So he's outside in the garden and we had to keep to strict social distancing rules. And um, we coped very well, actually. Everything was set out um, before we started filming. And if, if you can see from the film, that's one of the interesting things about the film is we, every character has to keep within social distance and still explore all these things. Janine, this was a lot more than simply pointing a smartphone at your husband. Um, it's been quite technically difficult. Um, I just wonder, in all of this, whether you have got the bug for it, whether you see yourself possibly moving into doing a bit of directing, a bit of uh, camera work in, uh, when, when all of this ghastly period is finally over. Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, I enjoyed it very much, but um, I don't think I will start now, no. And did the ch children enjoy it? Yeah. They did. They loved it. They, 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 um, it was very hard work and they wanted to get off their schoolwork, but we didn't let them. So they, every time we, we said cut and we had to change things, they had to go down and do some more work. And they wanted to just play on the Xbox or something. We, we didn't let them. Janine, did it give you any new insight into what your husband does for a living by, by actually directing him? Um, no, I don't think we should. <laughs> no, there's nothing to learn there. <laughs> Eddie and Janine, the future of television. Thanks both very much for joining us this morning and good and luck with the film. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie and Janine Marson there, and Isolation Stories starts tomorrow evening at nine on ITV with the first drama, Mel, starring Sheridan Smith. Now, I began this morning by saying the right questions for all of us about how we behave uh, when, 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 we, when the lockdown ends are the crucial ones. It's not just ministers, it's the rest of us thinking about how we're going to travel and all of that. Um, a lot of those questions are, of course, about transport, the daily commute to holidays. And I'm joined now by Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary. Before we come on to transport, if I, if I may, Grant Shapps, let me ask you something that puzzles a lot of people. Um, the government says it's taken the right decisions at the right time. And above all, you've been trying to avoid the NHS going under um, by asking people to take some really tough decisions. By and large, we as a country have behaved ourselves properly. The NHS has coped with this. And yet, and yet, we have a very, very high death rate. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I mean, anyone who has died, I, I know uh, a number of people uh, now, um, or knew a number of people, is a huge tragedy, and uh, our heart goes out to, to, to all of them and their families. Um, I thought, actually, your interview with Serene Diamond, the, the, the statistician, was very uh, interesting, as he uh, cautioned against making these international comparisons for all the reasons that he sure. was explaining. And I, I'm uh, not making an international no, no, comparison. No, no, sure. Uh, I'm uh, just saying but, it's a very I mean, raw, you ask me the same raw question big as number. You, as, you, as, mm. as you ask him, uh, and I take my lead from people like uh, statisticians like Serene mm. Diamond. Uh, there's very interesting, for, for those who want to sort of look into this more, uh, article I, I read in The Guardian, I think it was on Thursday, by Professor David Spiegel-Holter, 
who goes in in detail to the reasons, but it was, he says, indeed, a factor of having to look at the excess mortalities over a period mm. of time rather than what's happening in the instant because yeah. there may be an awful lot of other demographics and, and so on and so forth involved. I'm still sort of confused as to why we've had such a high death rate. That's really the question, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I mean, I, I, I'm not to be evasive at all, um, as the scientists are saying, and, and, and in, indeed, Sir in Diamond, you interviewed, I think we'll have to judge that in the, the mm. lo longer run. It is, I imagine, a factor of the things that he was talking about, things like density of population, if you look at somewhere like uh, France, although they've also had, sadly, similarly high uh, figures. We have much denser cities, for example. It may also be a product of, um, we have excellent statisticians, the mm. Office of National Statistics, for example, counting uh, perhaps in a way that other countries don't. So I think it is the case, I think I'm right in saying it's the case that uh, outside of a hospital, if you are tested and are positive for COVID, even if that's not the reason of death, that would be, in count that would be counted. But not in some other countries. Not in some I mean, other countries. One, one of the things that people have talked about a lot, we've talked about on the programme a lot, is what is going on in care homes at the moment, because it does seem that people were transferred from hospitals into care homes to release pressure on hospitals, but without being tested first. So they were, in effect, carrying the COVID-19 into places where there were lots and lots of vulnerable people. Um, for instance, uh, Professor Keith Willett, who's NHS England's COVID-19 director, said, the expectation, therefore, is that in the next few weeks, care homes will be the epicentres of transmission back into society. There is something really serious happening in care homes. Well, I hope that not. won't be the case. And I, by the way, I think it's absolutely right that all of these issues are probably, mm. properly uh, looked into at the, the right time. I hope that won't be the case, that final prediction, simply for the fact that uh, infections in care homes are now falling rather than rising and everybody in a care home whether that's a patient or indeed a member of staff can be tested and they can be tested whether they are symptomatic or even asymptomatic so uh, that's now available because we've got this big expansion if, in test if, we, if we've been doing this a little bit earlier a lot yes. of people might not yes. have died yes if we had had a hundred thousand test capacity before this thing started uh, and the knowledge that we now have retrospectively, uh, mm. I'm sure many things can be different. The fact of the matter is this is not a country that had, although we're very big in pharmaceuticals as a country, we're not a country that had very large test capacity as been cut But we should, we should have done, uh, unlike Ger I mean, well, Germany. Ger has, Germany and we, happened, sh we should have done that. Germany we? happened to have an industrial base in, in test capacity. Mm. We happen to have in pharmaceuticals, an industrial base through the likes of AstraZeneca and GSK in, in, in pharma products. Um, you can't help where you start yeah. on these things, sure. but we have ramped that up very significantly so that coming out of this first wave and mm -hmm. now on the downward trend, we will be able to extend those tests to many more people. It might also be because of the lack of personal uh, protective equipment for people in care homes. Uh, care, uh, care England's chief executive, Professor Martin Green, says we are a long way behind because despite what the health secretary says about us being always regarded as a priority, clearly we weren't. We had PPE supplies disrupted and primary care completely withdrawing from care homes. We looked away from care homes as a country at the wrong moment, didn't well, we? Again, I think, you know, when you look at care homes, most care homes would have previously, prior to this, um, per most, most are private, and most will have been purchasing mm. their PPE um, privately. Obviously, I mean, the state, uh, the government, the army has stepped in, and you know, as has been said many times, there are now over a billion pieces delivered, with millions of piece being, pieces, pieces being delivered every day to the whole um, health and, and okay. social care sector. Um, uh, so. It is a fact, and I think it's worth just stressing that this is a global problem. I saw on 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 on, on reported these German protests by doctors outside the German Bundestag uh, for guess what sure. lack of PPE. PPE yes, we are absolutely. all well, let's, let's working talk. hard to try. To I'm sure you are, gaps. but let's let's talk about it here because the the NHS gets through 150,000 gowns, for instance, every single day, which by a process of mathematics means a million gowns a week. How many gowns are we sending them a week? Yeah, well, it, when I look at the total oh. figures, I don't know the exact figure on gowns, so let me say well, that. When, just... I look at the, when I look at the exact figures per day, uh, it's not unusual that we are delivering 12 to 15 million items a day, many of which well, are, are it, Items are all sorts of things, but I'm, yeah. I'm just sticking with gowns. Is it possible? I know there's a press conference later on today to mm. get that figure, because it's a very important way of measuring how the government is doing. Oh, yes. I mean, these numbers are so available you, every single day for... for, for so you can get to the gowns things. figure later at on. The, at the five o'clock uh, or four o'clock, whatever time the press conference is this afternoon, I know that when I've done the number 10 
press conference. I have all of that data. It's collected every day. We're being completely open with it. And as I say, millions of pieces are, mm. of PP are being um, delivered every single day. And, it, and, and the army and the yeah. whole infrastructure of government and many volunteers are helping with this. Before this all started, not one single gown was being stockpiled by this country. That was a bad mistake, wasn't it? Well, I think there are many lessons that can be learned. It's very, what, what's interesting is when we look at this idea of a pandemic, which has been uh, for many years a sort of mm. high on the risk register, the sort of pandemic that most people were thinking of was an influenza pandemic uh, of the regular type. Uh, but this clearly has taken the world by storm in a completely different way to anything that more people imagined for a hundred years. So um, since, since the Spanish flu, so 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 again, you know, let's let's have full okay. and proper look at all of these things. We've talked endlessly about testing, but testing doesn't really mean anything unless you then track and trace Absolutely. people. So you've, the government has said that you are going to recruit and train 18,000 people to track and trace. How many have we recruited so far? I, I don't have a number for the number uh, so far, but what I can tell you is we will have 18,000 by the time these, this is released. I mean, I don't, what I don't want okay. to do, what I was going to say, Andrew, I'm not going to get into a race do, about yeah, it. What I don't want to do is get into okay. another 100,000 tests being done. But, so we did it in the end. We'll do it with 18,000 people being trained. It's not a well, complicated thing to train for. It doesn't take a very long time to do. I the suppose important the thing is that the app, which is going into testing this week, into live testing this week, that that is rolled out and that people download it. And that will help mm. with a lot of the automation, the, the track of sure. tracking of, of who's got it. The more important thing, perhaps, is is 18,000 anything like enough? Because a lot of people who specialise in this area say it's a drop in the ocean. It's much, much more. You're going to 100,000 people we're going to need. Yeah. Are you going to carry on recruiting people beyond the 18,000 so, so we have enough to track and trace everybody? So, so the 18,000 is the initial plan. And the reason why um, we think that might be the right number, though it's actually, as I say, relatively straightforward to... Uh, recruit and train people in this particular activity, uh, apart from the 3,000 uh, medically trained people who are already mm. involved in this, um, is the, the software. And this app, which I just want to go back to, we will be asking the whole country, uh, where possible, to download this uh, mm. mobile phone app, which will help automatically to remove the need for people, individuals, to be involved. Because that will say, uh, if you and I have it, and we are within Bluetooth range of each other, uh, and I, I'm late, later tested and I'm positive, it will alert you. So that removes the need to have a person in between there. So and you are absolutely sure we're going to have enough tracker and tracer people uh, trained up well, in time just, for this? Just, just, as, just as we've done. Oh, oh in terms I mean, of the 18,000, absolutely. Uh, as I say, it's not, a, it's, it, it's, it's not a, a, a ridiculous ask at all. And one thing I'd say is, you, know, you see the way that this country and the population has come forward to volunteer and be involved in the national mm. effort, the three quarters of a million people who volunteered in the first but, place. It is incredible. So sure. there is clearly a pool of people who'd be very happy to help in any way that they can, but the 18,000 specifically, absolutely. We'll have them ready just seems, when the app is ready. It just seems to a lot of people as if we were not well prepared for this. You talked about gowns and the flu uh, pandemic, flu possibilities, but the government's own advisors said we should be stockpiling gowns and the government decided not to. And that does, again, I seem to say to you, seem to be a pretty serious mistake. Well, look, I, I, I disagree by comparison to what anybody thought was in the realms of likely possibilities. Well, so lots of people were talking you, about this kind of pandemic uh, in the uh, past. The scientists well, have well, been for a long say, time. The government advice, and I've been in, in government over a period of time, and the one thing I know is that we are a very scientifically led uh, administration, right. particularly this one. And if the scientists say you should be doing this, as we've seen throughout this pandemic and our response to it, that is mm. the response that we, we take. But it's you not say, always, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, say, to it's jump not in. It's quite as clear cut as you're sure, suggesting, well, because what people would have been preparing for is the flu, uh, not for well, COVID-19. Uh, all I'm asking, you know, ministers always say we follow the scientific yeah. advice. But in this case, the scientists, the advice was stockpile gowns and ministers decided not to. Why not? I, I don't know where you're getting that specific detail from, but I'm not you're aware of that on. particular advice. I never saw it my, my, myself. But um, and there certainly were stockpiles of certain right. materials. But, you know, again, let's be completely open, completely transparent with it, and let's see what lessons the country learns learn. okay, let's, for the future, uh, even if these are a one in 100 year occurrences. Let's move to your own area, mm -hmm. transport. Are we going to quarantine people for 14 days or whatever when they come into this country? Well, I do think that up until now, of course, the numbers coming in are very small and largely Brit mm -hmm. the Brits returning British nationals who were abroad, about 3 million people 
ordinarily in March would, would travel on holiday and elsewhere. So there were a lot of people to get back to the country. And then, of course, they yep, joined yes. the lockdown. Um, I so think it is important. Are we going to do it? Or yeah, not? I was going to say, I think it's important as we're seeing the numbers decrease and the R rate, uh, we hope, decrease, and we'll have more advice on that later in the week, um, that we do ensure that the sacrifices, in a sense, social distancing that we're asking the British people to make are matched by anybody who comes to this country. Mm. So I am actively looking at these issues right now so that when we... French have done it. And at the beginning of all of this, right at the start of the epidemic, a hundred other countries introduced quarantines or other measures, but Britain did not. Why not? Well, for a start, we have millions of people uh, yeah. have experienced mm -hmm. many deaths. So it's not actually a, 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 a clear... That wasn't a, a clear point at which it may have been an advantage. And the scientific advice, and to answer your question directly, the medical and scientific advice at the moment, at the time was that's not going to make um, a survive. This is a serious point under consideration. Um, I just don't understand this with respect, which is how can it be if people uh, have got COVID-19 and are travelling around the world, including into Britain, it was wrong not to stop them, do um, temperature checks, health checks, possibly even quarantining people um, to prevent this coming in. People, you know, it's a common sense point. If people have got it and they're coming to Britain, why are we not stopping them and quarantining so, so them? So it's actually a question I directly asked the Chief Medical Officer mm. uh, right at the beginning of, of, of this, when indeed before the lockdown we were still meeting in, in, in person. Uh, and the answer was quite simply, when, we look, when, when they looked at the science, what they found is, although you might, by having a complete lockdown, uh, of the of the borders, whilst you might delay it for three, four, five days, it would still uh, find its way in, and you'd be in exactly the same problem, and right, okay. created a new problem, which is it would have given us five days. No, it would have prevented a lot of um, Brits from being able to mm. return home and be with their families. That's actually All what right. it would have done. All right, let's turn to trains. Another very, very difficult problem is if you're going to enforce social distancing by two metres or whatever in trains, then we heard earlier on um, you're going to have to cut the number of people in a train by to something like 12% of the norm, which means the vast majority of commuters around the country will not be able to get to work by train. Is, uh, how are you thinking about doing this? How are you going to organise it? Yeah, you're absolutely right of the, about the scale of the, the problem here. Of course, about 95% of commuters aren't travelling at all now because mm -hmm. we've got key workers. The, the first thing is, obviously, we'll expand the number of trains and buses running. The second thing to say is active travel, I think, is a very important part of this, by which I mean cycling, walking and so on. Um, and so we've seen a massive expansion. But if, you, if you're 30 miles away from work, you can't, uh, you can't walk there. Uh, but, um, so will you, for instance, be um, distant? distancing people who are queuing at bus stops or distancing people queuing outside train stations and on platforms and then limiting the number of people who can get onto a train, possibly by forward booking. So I'm looking at the train, working with the train companies, unions and the rest of them, all of the um, above. And there are a series of different things that we can do, including, for example, staggering work times, working with business and organisations mm. to do that. But I just want to make the point about bikes. You're right, not everyone will be able to cycle. I totally accept that. There's been a massive increase. I've been looking mm. at the figures. Hundreds of percent more people using an existing scheme where you can go to your employer right. and ask for a bike uh, through Good. that, which you pay back through the loan and effectively before you pay tax. Now, that's a very popular scheme. And I think okay. active transport... Uh, active uh, well, mobility. Like let me ask you about we sorry, do a lot more of. one other area where you certainly can't cycle, which is flying abroad on the family holiday. You've said you're not going to book a holiday this year. Do you think in practical terms, this world in which most people felt they had some kind of right to get on a plane and go abroad for their holiday is coming to an end? Yes, I haven't said I wouldn't book a holiday this year, only that I wouldn't book one yet. And I can't, in fact, because of course, all the Domestically, we can't travel around. Um, and internationally, the Foreign Commonwealth Office has said we shouldn't be travelling. And indeed, most countries won't allow you to yes. fly in. So that's just a fact okay. of life at the moment. It's clearly going to take um, some time, and particularly for aviation of all industries, to come out of this. We'll support and help where we can. Uh, but I do think we have to be realistic uh, about what the shape of that will look like. Grant Chaps, thanks very much indeed for talking to us today. That's all from me. Thanks for watching and thanks to all my guests. More politics straight after this on BBC One. But until next week, from me, goodbye.